we our hope is that you will continue to engage with us because as we do this journey into the future, I fundamentally believe that it is a collaborative experience. No one person has all the answers as to what the future is going to be or which prediction is going to be right. It's a collaboration. It takes a village and it takes dialogue and it takes a lot of learning by doing, which is what I'm doing every day in my work, both as running Next Step, a consultant for company, but also as I interface with leaders through EGA and my keynote speaking, it's all a learning adventure. So I am going to officially turn over to Thomas to begin taking us into the future with some perspectives of what he is learning on a daily basis today and some of the latest um, innovations. So Thomas, share, share and jump in. Thank you very much. I am looking for my PowerPoint, which is not showing up like it did when we practiced this. <laughs> So just give me a second. <clears throat> Worst case, I can uh, I can be your AI companion. <laughs> Not quite so well, but no, I just I got it. Okay, there let me do, can you see it, please. Yes, if you do in share screen, we'll be able to see even better. And I'm sorry, in slideshow. One sec. Let me just do this one more time. Share screen, slideshow, and then go. Exactly. And it disappeared again. No. Proving that we're uh, learning together. Perfect. Well, it's not so much learning as that we've done this so many times that it's good to set up properly. And once you set up properly, then you just keep on going. So let's just keep on going at this point. Okay. So welcome, everybody. I hope you're doing well. And I hope you are feeling healthy and your life is full of love. I love saying that in the beginning. Uh, my name is Thomas Anglero. I'm a proud father, CEO, and former uh, Nordic CTO for Cognizant. This is our third session. And what I wanted to do, I wanted to start off this first session by going back to this one slide. I think this was a slide I used back in November. And what I wanted to do was to re <laughs> rehash how right I was, <laughs> which is a really scary thing. So back in November, I showed this slide, and this was one of the many future predictions I said for 2024. And with this slide, I said that in 2024, we're going to see personal AI assistance on your mobile phone. What is a personal AI assistant? That is a digital AI assistant that resides in your phone, and it's, it's connected to all of your appointments, all your activities, and it talks to other people's personal AI assistants for you. So, for example, you have a doctor's appointment today or, yeah, today because it's not available yet. So today you have to call your doctor. You wait on hold. The receptionist answer. The receptionist check the calendar, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill. Thomas, Thomas, can I interrupt you for a second? Your yeah. audio is indeed varying quite a bit. I think if you, yeah, get closer to the microphone. My big, you hear me better now? To focus. Yeah, that's better. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. So just, I started with new software. So thank you. And that was a learning lesson. So in the old scenario where you actually picked up the phone and called the doctor, that's gone. And I said in 2024, these personal AI assistants will be on your mobile phone. How right I was. <laughs> this, But I didn't know it would come this fast. So, uh, and just to remind you on all these different scenarios, the value of having a personal AI assistant is not just for doctor's appointments, but also for things like, um, well, of course, anything to do with meetings, setting up meetings and finding times for meetings, but more important things like dating. And I think, it, and, and I think the dating thing is kind of important because look at Jennifer's face, ignore her face <laughs> because no, because um, a lot, you know, after COVID, the whole, how do you meet people and things like that has changed dramatically. And so how we interact as human beings and how do we socialize, right? And what I'm seeing now as I look into the technology crystal ball and understand all, and I connect all the dots is that I actually am beginning to see this very strange scenario of where you know, people are afraid of meeting other people, but they won't be afraid to let their personal AI assistant go on a date with the other person's 
personal AI assistant first. So the two AI assistants will go on a date and then they'll both come back and say, oh, he was a really nice guy. And the other one will say, oh, no, he's in it. Whatever. You know, so. so it sounds crazy, but we're here. And here's the proof that we're here. Remember, I talked about this in November. And it's happened. So two days ago, Microsoft, they came out with the software part. The hardware part of putting a personal AI assistant to a mobile phone is the, the chipset. And by the way, yes, in the last seven days, Qualcomm came out with Qualcomm 9, uh, Red Dragon, what's it called? Red Dragon, I forgot the name, Dragon something 9. And that, the, the sole purpose of that version 9 of the chipset is for AI, for the personal AI assistant. And two days ago, Microsoft came out with the new software for personal AI assistants. And I didn't know that they're working on it, but it just made sense that this stuff was coming. And why it's so revolutionary is that Microsoft went completely against what other people were doing and they made their personal AI assistant, the LLM, massively smaller. ChatGPT is huge. It's terabits. It's petabits in size. Google Gemini petabits. You can't fit that into a mobile phone. But Microsoft Research has said the best way to do it to have maximum performance is to actually make it smaller. So two days ago, Microsoft released their LLM, and it actually is better in performance, uses less battery, is cheaper, and it fits into a mobile phone. So it is here, and your virtual dating life is coming. That's my little sense of humor. Anyway, so what I said in 2024 I thought it would take all of 2024. We're only in March, and the hardware is now here as of last week, and the software is here as of two days ago. This stuff is coming fast. Last time I spoke, I believe it was in January, I talked about figure.ai humanoid robot. That's a picture of the humanoid robot. And if it's okay if you didn't weren't here for the last one, I'll summarize real fast. I showed this video of the robot making a cup of coffee, how amazing it is that these humanoid robots, this one particular from figure.ai, that's the website and the company's name, it was able to make this cup of coffee by watching a human being uh, do the same thing. So we've gone from programming robots to where a robot just basically looks at us, just like the webcam is looking at you right now. And after watching you for literally under a half hour, it, it could duplicate what you do. But that's not what's amazing. In the last few days, Figure.ai, the company that owns the humanoid robot you're looking at, partnered with OpenAI, and they took ChatGPT and they put it into the mind of this humanoid robot. This, you now can talk to this thing, interact with it. So I'm going to show you a video. It only lasts two minutes, but please uh, enjoy the video. You're going to see one of the developers talking to the robot in a kitchen uh, environment and listen to the robot, and this is mind boggling. By the way, this did not exist two months ago. It exists now. So if they were to make that, that level of progress in two months, imagine what they're gonna do in the next six. So let's roll the video and enjoy. Hey, figure one, what do you see right now? I see a red apple on a plate in the center of the table, a drying rack with cups and a plate, and you standing nearby with your hand on the table. Great, can I have something to eat? Sure thing. Great. Can you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? on it. So I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. This is not program. It's doing this all in real time. Great. So based on the scene right now, where do you think the dishes in front of you go next? Trying to figure it out in real time. The dishes on the table, like that plate and cup, are likely to go into the drying rack next. Great. Can you put them there? So ChatGP comes to the conclusion, tells the humanoid robot, the body does it to perfection. 
is the marriage of both software and hardware at a level we've never seen before. This is done in the last two months. This didn't exist two months ago. All right, so how do you think you did? I, I think I did pretty well. The Apple found its new owner, the trash is gone, and the tableware is right where it belongs. I agree. Thanks, figure one. You're welcome. If there's anything else you need help with, just let me know. So there you go. Now, what's amazing because this chat GPT, it could, the exact same demo can be done in 50 different languages. And by the way, it's not a demo because what was, when they talked about the video, this was not a demo. It actually was live and they weren't sure what the thing would do, but it did it. Um, mind boggling where we're at. I talked about before that humanoid robots will be um, placed in the office environment, starting in factories and things like that at the end of 2024. It probably happened a little bit before that. This thing is moving incredibly fast because all of everybody knows about ChatGPT is now the mind of all these humanoid, not all, but the leading humanoid robot. Let me give you another one that have you start thinking about what is this environment that we're working in now? The 2024 now, this is not future. This is here now. What is this environment that we're working in? This next example I want to show you to really get your brain to start thinking is applying for a job. Some of you, if any of you are in Norway, there's Finn.no and then there's other websites where you find a job. Say you find a job with the perfect position. This AI company has actually created an AI that will almost guarantee that you get a job interview. What it does is you find the job, the job description for that job, say, oh, I want that job. You copy paste the job description into the AI and then you upload your CV and then it rewrites the entire CV to perfection for that job. So I have a short video. The audio is very low. I apologize. So please just listen hard. It's a very short video, but it's the um, the gentleman explaining this uh, application. And if you want to use it because you're on the job hunt, write, write, write down the website. Here we go. This one is for everybody looking for the fastest and easiest way to make your resume. You will not believe this. You got to keep watching. Head to wondering.ai and upload your resume. Now we're going to grab this job description from Indeed to become a digital email marketing specialist. Copy and paste that in. Then we click generate hyper tailored resume. This is where the AI is doing the magic and it's creating the perfect solution that's going to help to get us hired. It's honing in on the keywords to get us past the gatekeeper, which is the applicant tracking system and making a resume that the hiring manager is going to love and call us in for this interview so we can go ahead and get hired. We can make any minor edits that we want and then we can even preview it and download as a PDF so it's ready to get us hired and we can get this job. Let's go. How many seconds did it take? <laughs> 15 seconds, 10 seconds to go from, oh, I found my dream job to there it is in that screen, the perfect CV customized with the perfect keywords for that one position. The implications are beyond the software. Let's move to people. What happens when everyone's using this software and everyone's using AI to apply for a job? In the old days, old days were only, what, a year ago, well, a year and a half ago, it ChatGP didn't exist, so up until a year and a half ago, when you apply for a job, there was a very personal part in your cover letter, if you included a cover letter or in your CV itself. Today, the AI is writing it. How do you choose the best people if everybody's using this? What does your office end up looking like with the type of people in your, the, that make up the culture of your company? This is where Jennifer and I are going in this discussion today, where we're focusing on is really the culture of your organization and the influence that tech has. And this, I love this, but it also concerns me because you could somehow understand who the person is in the old days through the CV. Now I can't, or you can't either. So let me show you one more piece, one more example of amazing technology, and I'll drive home my final point and I'll give the, and I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Devin, if you're a developer, this is your best friend or your enemy. I don't know how you're going to take it. Four days ago, this company released another startup AI company released Devin. Devin is a, the world's first AI software engineer. What that means is it's a developer, an AI that's a complete, complete developer. It does everything a developer can, can do. So I have another short video for you. And what you're going to see is Devin at work. This is the CEO 
describing what Devin does. He's going to show you a screen, the same desktop that every developer has in all the windows. And he's going to give Devin an assignment. Like you've given a, a, a developer an assignment first thing in the morning, and Devin's going to actually do the assignment in two minutes. It would usually take somebody eight hours. And enjoy this. This is mind-boggling stuff. Hey, I'm Scott from Cognition AI, and today I'm really excited to introduce you to Devin, the first AI software engineer. Let me show you an example of Devin in action. I'm going to ask Devin to benchmark the performance of Llama on a couple of different API providers. From now on, Devin is in the driver's seat. First, Devin makes a step-by-step -step plan of how to tackle the problem. After that, it builds the whole project using all the same tools that a human software engineer would use. Devin has its own command line, its own code editor, and even its own browser. In this case, Devin decides to use the browser to pull up API documentation so that it can read up and learn how to plug into each of these APIs. Is learning Here, Devin runs into an unexpected error. Devin actually decides to add a debugging print statement, reruns the code with the debugging print statement, and then uses the error in the logs to figure out how to fix the bug. Finally, Devin decides to build and deploy a website with full styling as the visualization. You can see the website here. All of this is possible today because of the advancements that we've made in both reasoning and long-term planning. It's a really hard problem, and we've only just started, but we're super excited about the progress that we've made so far. In the meantime, if you'd like to try out Devin on your own real-world tasks, send us a request below, and we'd be happy to forward it to Devin. I think it's really cool. They said, we'll be happy to forward to Devin. We will not be happy to forward to a person. <laughs> like forward to the AI. It's crazy. I'm going to skip this slide because I, like, I talked too much, but I want to spend the last part here. You saw Devin, right? You experienced Devin. And why do I include videos? Because if I just say it out loud, your mind could go but so far. But if you actually see the video of it working, if the conclusion of the video, oh, that's not impressive, that's great. Because what you, what you understand now is that what looks so simplistic, they've taken some a job that somebody has gone to school for four to eight years to perfect, and then years of experience, they now have done it in software, and it actually did the job in about 25 seconds the video was at the, the, the task. This is mind-boggling. So where I want to end my talk or conclude my talk before I give it to Jennifer is that it this is changing the dynamics of the office. What type of discussions are your companies having? Do they understand? Do your leadership, do you see the changes that I have just uh, shown you here? And do you discuss at a table like these people are doing here, what are the implications of these changes for our company? And most importantly, for the culture of our company. And then do your meetings, or some of your meetings like what are here, it says, what if we don't change at all? And the conclusion is, well, and something magically just happens. I fear because I talk to several leaders and they don't know what to do. So they always sort of indirectly end with that second sentence. Well, I guess something magical is just gonna happen. It's not gonna magically happen. And the cultures of our companies are changing because your new colleague is going to be either a software or a humanoid robot. This stuff is coming. I'm not crazy. That's why I show you the video. It's actually moving faster than I ever thought it would move. What, what I want to drive home is these discussions you need to have now with your leadership. You have this with your colleagues and discuss what's going on. One last story I want to share. No slides is I had a lunch the other day with one of my colleagues, a developer, and uh, he forgot that, you know, I was an executive and he goes, he just thinks I was a buddy. He goes, Thomas, let me tell you, let me tell you. He goes, my boss the other, mo other morning gave me an assignment. It usually takes me a whole day to do the assignment. I put it in a chat GDP. I was done in 15 minutes. And he went and I asked him, what do you do with the rest of the day? What happens to the cultures of our organization if our colleagues are using the tools the correct way, are being extremely productive, but we as leaders are not setting up the environment in our office 
to actually benefit from all the other hours that they now freed up. This is where I wanted to hand off Jennifer to have this perspective in your head, because these are real issues. And I don't think top lead, certain leaders are not hearing these issues, but there are many people who are actually using AI and, and benefiting from it. So with that, Jennifer, I will hand over the microphone to you. Perfect. Is there any questions, anything like that? Yeah, let's let's take a minute because you've thrown a lot of things from our AIs dating each other to doing our jobs <laughs> for us. Is that the only thing you remember? <laughs> That's funny. I, I would love to hear from some of our uh, participants just. Well, somebody said when you go on an AI date, wonder who splits the bill. That's hysterical. <laughs> as long as you pay in Bitcoin, who cares, right? <laughs> well, Dom's vote is always divide. So uh, maybe that's divide your Bitcoin. But <laughs> I, I'm just curious for those uh, those here with us, what are you seeing in the workplace? Are, are you seeing people actively talking about, hey, I submitted my resume by having my AI bot uh, customize it? Or are they hiding away while having the tool do their job? What What's the reality in your worlds? Or or, or do you not see it at all? That's an, that's, I think that, I think, is the most, because I actually talked to a lot of people. A lot of people said, no, none of us use generative AI. This, you guys, just let us know. Thumbs up or thumbs down, whatever you get the video on. I mean, do you see it in the office? Do you use it in your office? And don't be embarrassed if you do or don't. I don't know. Yeah, this... It all depends. We're, we're well, as it relates to <laughs> applications, as it relates to applications and resumes and CVs, I've definitely used it myself. I have been a little bit uh, tentative about it more so recently, just because you hear a lot of things and buzz in, in the industry that sometimes those hiring managers are able to tell if you're using it. And so it, it, it kind of knocks you off of the, the running mm -hmm. no matter what. I wonder if the wonder in AI has some way to kind of overcome that or if it just generates such a good one that it shows your skill set and being able to command the technology so I, i'd be interested would, to find that out i give you i give you uh, talk to you one-on-one -on -one advice let's ignore everybody else right so <laughs> take the conclusion of what wondering.ai produces and then put that into there's a bunch of ai companies that they guarantee they say we'll take whatever text and we'll make sure that no ai detector will be able to detect is written by ai so I would take the PDF that's done by Wondering AI, and I would put it into the other AI service and make sure that it's non-AIable, if you call that it's such a word. And then you're good to go, and congratulations on your new job. Okay. That's okay. a good idea. One nerd to another nerd. A strategy I would suggest to show <laughs> your, your leading edge, but you're also good at discerning, is you create your resume without the AI and then you do the AI wonder I AI version, send them both in to show that that you are human and that you are using the tools. Because actually I'll, I'll share one uh, side point. I'm, I, I'm doing a little bit of career coaching with a couple of executives that came out of very large companies in the US and are now looking for their next role. And with both of these individuals, I suggested about a month ago, as you're preparing for the interview for a senior executive, blah, 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 be sure you could answer the question, how are you using AI? What type of AI tool will you bring with us when you join our company? And both said, ah, they won't ask that. Well, within a week, they both came back saying, thank you for that heads up. I did have an answer because they did ask me that. So it's it's almost expected that you're you're dabbling in some way. Yeah, I definitely noticed um, in the previous applications that I've been involved in is that a lot of companies are now asking for video submissions to kind of counteract that lack of personality that can kind of come from those AI really? resumes. And so it's taking a lot more extra effort for somebody to take a phone and, and record themselves speaking and introducing themselves. But it also shows how... Uh, how much they want that job um, because they're willing to do something like that. But then I was thinking, could could I take an AI video of myself, download the the job description, upload some video of me talking, and then just recreate a whole nother AI video? 
<laughs> okay, so my technical answer is <laughs> uh, there is uh, a soft. Uh, it's not that good. So the answer is, is it's not ready for prime time yet. But there is an AI company that you you upload twenty five images of itself. It creates an avatar of you that's pretty lifelike. Uh, it then um, listen. You have to then talk for like five minutes, and then it gets the tonal tonality of your voice, and then they can replicate you. But I wouldn't use that right now for job interview type thing, thing like that. I think I think them. The company's asking for the live video is though the video is wonderful because so many meetings, so many uh, projects and stuff are worked from home and how you come across on the camera is everything. It, it is everything. So getting a video of you, I think that's almost, no, it's not as better than the CV, but that is a A and B, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of importance, because if you don't, if you come off like you know, you're never going to get the job, right? And then, so, um, yeah, what, cool. I, I think well, that's well, great. Well, to be honest, the only, the only, when I was hiring for this company that was accepting those kinds of video submissions, the only kind of people that we hired were the people who did the videos. We, we, we looked at the resumes, but it was really yeah. just a quick glance over because time saving, you know, you see somebody in, in person right away, you know. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Other the, uses of AI that you're seeing or other questions before I jump into a few other perspectives. And not just about AI, anybody, anybody have an opinion on the robots? Am I completely, have I been watching way too much Netflix? Does anybody want to challenge? Please challenge me. Not I, that I'm going to challenge Henry back. <laughs> I'm sorry. Henry. Yeah. I, 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 I can you hear me? Okay. Or yeah. Yes. Perfect. Um, I think that this is uh, very interesting, and I've uh, kickstarted our own process in my consultancy company where I work right now, and uh, it's a large one. And I, I, I think it is easy that the leadership is not properly understanding what's happening in front of them, being inside uh, um, uh, defense or uh, being in within. Uh, uh, road or uh, this uh, transportation or health where we are uh, quite a strong uh, i think it is easy for uh, for all parties and also the internal management to underestimate the impact on how everything will be changing and to be aware of this uh, and so your i look forward to your further discussion on the topic because i i it's a change right yeah. It's definitely a change, a big change, and I don't think we see it uh, clearly enough. Yeah, it's also a choice. It's a it's a big choice amongst leadership yeah. too. And that I, I've noticed in my industry, I'm in social media uh, marketing, and so we do uh, a lot of service for clients. And so mm -hmm. it really comes down to whether or not the client is comfortable contracting an agency who uses AI or they want to run away from them completely. Um, and they make that active choice. And so I've worked with brands like from PG&E, which are big, massive umbrellas, and they use AI, where I've also worked in agency models that have like a 20 clients, maybe a million dollar revenue, and they don't use AI at all mm. as, a, as, an, as a choice, just because they want to keep that kind of personification within their agency and in, in delivering that content to make sure that the clients know that they put their hard work into it, right? They're not taking shortcuts. So it's it's very interesting that but, uh, it's not being as accepted in that way. But, but then you're telling your client that you're providing a non-optimal solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? We, can, we, can, we cannot compete. Sorry, I don't know anybody who can read every book, every written in the next one hour. Right? No, for sure. So, no, um, that's a very bad admittance, I think, if, if you understand the power of what AI can do, right? It is a teamwork. AI will not be replaced. It will replace some positions, right? Just like I always say, the elevator guy who used to be there, who takes you up and down the elevator, was replaced by a button. AI will replace some positions. But imagine, um, you, all you know how competent you are. You take your competence plus AI together. What can you accomplish? That's the way you're supposed to look at it. It is, it is, it is, um, I would, <laughs> when I try to have fun with the idea, I always say, think of that version of you that never went out drinking when you were in college. You know, how, how smart would that version of you be if you never went out drinking? I'm looking at you, Jennifer. No, I'm just joking. 
So. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. But if you take that version of you, any of you who, who never partied or whatever, some of you go, I never, part, whatever. And you take what your confidence in all your years or decades of experience, that's where we're at today. And this is why it's so powerful. And you shouldn't, cannot, you cannot ignore it. That's why this slide I had of um, something magical will happen. It's a lot of what the conclusions, a lot of leaderships are coming with. Can Which I, is why we chose to... the, the topic today as being a Jennifer Philip. Jennifer Philip yeah. wanted to say something. Sorry, let Philip yeah, just. Yeah, sorry. I, and I, I'm listening. So there, there we go. I'll just put this as backdrop. Go ahead. Philip, go for it. Yeah. Okay. What's the price point on those humanoid ro ro robots? The price point today is $200,000 per robot. The goal is to get the price point down to $20,000 per robot. The time frame to get those that price point down there, trying to go for Christmas of this year. Impressive. That is something. <laughs> the, the, the challenge, though, is um, distribution, not just of the robots, but if it breaks down, you know, just like a car, you have to have a network yeah. of, of car dealerships and places to fix it. So that's the, that's what's really going to slow down the deployment of the humanoid robots. Um, their intelligence, as you've seen in eight weeks, is insane. So if you graph that by Christmas, they're going to be beyond smart. Um, it's, it's if it breaks down and stuff like that. So they they are coming, and once they get the logistics worked out. Well, also, you got to manufacture them. Yes. I mean, we yes. all want one of those. I mean, yes. how, are they actually capable of making that, that sort of volume? That's going to keep the price up. Well, here's the scary part. So you have uh, the Chinese who are now manufacturing them, and these startups are now talking to the Chinese and the Vietnamese and the Malaysians yeah. to start manufacturing parts of the whole thing. It is all in process. They're not doing it in the steps. They know how to do these things in volume. And uh, the part that was missing was the intelligence, and that's why the video I showed with ChatGPT was exciting, is that mm -hmm. the humanoid robot uh, manufacturers are going, good, we can stick to the robot, the, the body of the robot, and we just throw the software in there from another partner. So it's, it's actually accelerated because a lot of them thought, oh, we have to do the, the brains as well. Now they figured out, let's just use the best of the best. So you can have ChatGBT in there or Google Gemini or Facebook Llama. This is accelerated. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm thinking in terms of the moving parts, because yeah. replicating human mo movement of our hands and arms is extremely difficult. Yeah. And so manufacturing that in mass is a huge challenge. I could certainly see a static talking robot um, you know, with, with humanoid features being um, relatively easy to mass manufacture. But mass manufacturing uh, a robot like that, figure one, that's another thing altogether. And Philip, I agree with you. So to keep it short and also respect Jennifer's time, my prediction is that the first robots that we will be see used um, mass-wise, like you're talking about, will be uh, just like an arm that picks something up, something simplistic to do a simple yep. job. Mm -hmm. that'll be the first generation of robots. And it's it's not so much, it is because it's cheaper, quicker, blah, blah, blah. But the biggest reason is, I believe, is because we human beings, we need time to adapt to having a humanoid robot standing next to me. Okay, that's just gonna, we need time. So if it starts off with a little arm that picks up an apple and I have that next to me, I get used to that in the workplace, you know, something simplistic or some robot rolling around on a wheel that reminds yeah. everybody to attend the meeting. Once we human beings start getting used to that, then you can introduce a humanoid robot and it won't freak you out in the office. You'll be like, oh, hi, Phil, how's it going? I'm doing fine. I want to go to lunch. You know, we, we, we need time. It's the human factor. We'll freak out if we start having humanoid robots next to us in January, Christmas. Yeah. And in that respect, just as an example, in the Bay Area, it was five to six years that we started seeing the little DoorDash robots that were par powered by Starship. And at first it was one of those things that everybody on the sidewalk would stop and go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what is that? Yeah, there you go. Um, and today you just, you talk to it. It's like, oh, great sandwich you brought me yesterday. How about pizza tomorrow? It's, it's a complete adaptation, but does take time for the people to understand. But as, as we have, uh, 
clearly denoted it is time to move forward. It's no longer a question of will I, it's a question of how. And in the latest stats that I've seen from organizations, the investment that companies, global 500 companies are making in technology is growing by at least 200%. 82% of leaders invest, doubling their investment in the technology to be ready to move forward, continuing to see accelerating growth in quality some things robots are simply able to do better. Some things they're able to do more efficiently. Some things are able to do a lot more quickly that ultimately, even at this early stage at the end of 23, was already showing 5% improvement in bottom line results. And that was three months ago. And just in those three months, the humanoid robot has gone from knowing how to put a cup into a coffee machine to actually carving an apple, to putting the dishes away and making dinner. So I would predict by the end of this year, we're gonna see that 5% go up to more like 10% for those that are actually leaning in to the technology. And that's across the entire organization. A lot of organizations started out with chat GPT for marketing, to generate marketing content, whether that was written, whether that was images. That's gone beyond entire marketing departments that used to be 50 people may now be two people that are leveraging and using the technology. They're understanding, the bots are understanding the market. They're interfacing with the customers. They're analyzing the patterns. They're not waiting for prompts of what should be created, but they're deciding the kinds of personalized messages they're communicating with Firefly to generate the images and actively creating the responses. The people are simply overseeing and are taking the data from that and saying, where do we go next? Building on top of, looking for those next opportunities. The people that are using the technology. From a sales point of view, we're seeing more organizations doubling down and using technology to coach and train new salespeople, to provide those reminders, to connect back to what the customer talked about in the last meeting, to do all of the administration, freeing that salesperson's precious time to do the human interface, the conversations, not the admin behind the sales activity that at one point was 80% of a salesperson's job was tracking, following up, looking for things, researching, that's done by the technology. And whether it's using technology to screen applications, using technology to rank applications or onboarding people, we see HR teams outsourcing a lot of the detailed onboarding forms, administration training to the technology to provide true human resources, the empathy, asking the new employee, how are things going? What can make you feel more comfortable? How is your relationship with your manager? As opposed to which benefits package do you want? Have you gone through the training? Have you checked off the compliance? They don't have to think about those things anymore. So they can get out of the administration and into the human resources, not the technical details, which is clearly the case with customer service. This is the time that every organization has the opportunity to double down on people customer service. Globally, we as people are at a unique point because let's face it, a lot of people are really scared of what's happening in the world. There is no going back. Technology is moving quickly. It is impacting jobs. People are scared. When people are scared, what they actually respond to, it's human empathy. People who understand people. 
So organizations that will move ahead, in my opinion, are those that recognize the importance of people. Double down on customer success, customer satisfaction, customer relations, the salespeople working with the accounts, that human aspect, a huge opportunity to be very, very competitively positioned in the market while using the technology to drive the back end operations, to drive down those costs, to make the supply chain more efficient, to look at how can parts be manufactured in new ways. Let the technology do that while using the people for the things that people do best. And that includes helping people to really understand all of the interplays between the technology. As we're talking about humanoid robots, I think Dom asked, can, would the humanoid robot drive the self-driving car? Possibly, possibly, <laughs> or maybe more efficiently, the robot would be the one that actually produces the car that then has the intelligence that is powered by the high-speed technologies and the performance, while there is a digital twin sitting back at the center watching what's happening. These things are all working 100% together. Mm -hmm. This week in San Jose, there is the NVIDIA Developers Conference, one of the largest events for NVIDIA probably ever. And they've announced just recently going doubly down on recognition. Chips that, that have the ability to drive AI and recognition within video conferencing. So that video interview that somebody might be creating in another six months, you may be able to use an application to take a video of something you were in, a keynote speech that you did, modify that, add to it, put a cover on it, all within seconds when you combine the different technologies together. And that's- Jennifer? What, yeah, go ahead. May I just interrupt? Please. You talked about NVIDIA. So yesterday, literally yesterday, the CEO announced that NVIDIA has created, he launched, he says, we like to welcome to the world, world uh, I forgot the name of it, but it's the world's first humanoid robot operating system. They actually built an operating system for all human, all robot manufacturers, humanoid robot manufacturers. Just think about it, in terms of um, the PC, it didn't take off till we had an operating system. And once we had an operating system, which then allowed an ecosystem to be built on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. And video last night allowed, launched the operating system for humanoid robots. So how fast is it going to move now if the hottest stock in the world, who's making all the GPUs for all the AI in the world, yep. launched the first operating system for, it was a huge is huge so please i'm sorry to interrupt i just want to add to your examples was excellent no it's a perfect perfect addition and perfect example and and i think also tied to that the point you made earlier thomas that that whether it's gemini from google whether it's chat gpt whether it's perplexity whatever the tool is those are those are interfaces so back in the old days when we had the operating system on the different hardwares with the different applications, it's the same thing. If we have an NVIDIA GPU platform, that's the base. Yeah. Then you add the operating system on top, and then you add the different tools that sit on, on top of each other. And that's where we really get the true future. So the technology is here. The question, the biggest question that is in the minds of a lot of the CEOs of large corporations is about the people. But it's not how do we keep the people? It's not about how do I keep my job? The question is about how do we attract, retrain, upskill, support, provide compassion and empathy for the people in our company to be able to succeed in this world. 
if there's anything I see, it's more and more about the lack of people in the marketplace. The lack of people with the mindset to lean in and embrace technology and people with the openness, the curiosity, the desire to learn how to work with the technology. So in that BCG study, while 82% of corporations, the leaders said we need to double down on technology investment, 70% of those same leaders said, our biggest concern is we don't have the skills. We're investing in the technology. Now, how do we invest in the people to be able to use the technology so that we get that return? Can I can I make it even more complex? Please. So you you you're nailing it. And let's and add another one into this too. So you have all these cultural challenges, leadership challenges in the office, and you have the generational challenge of the, the Gen Zs. Mm-hmm. Who the hell knows how to manage them? <laughs> no, they're, I think they're we ex- have a couple with us here today. So that's what, maybe that's but hey, the they, they, they know their they know their greatness. There's nothing wrong with them, but God bless the Gen Zs because they're <laughs> redefining what is a nine to five job. They go, what the hell is nine to five? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Why do I have to go to the office? That makes no sense to me. Mm-hmm. Right? So they're bringing in all these issues, and guess what? The old people are getting older and they're retiring and all these Gen Z's are getting older and they're taking the jobs. So that's the way direction the workforce is going. And then you bring up all the issues you have. We have the technology. We have the the current workforce. Things are getting more and more complicated. And the skill set of a leader, that's the the gold in the office, in the the job, the, the human aspect the uh, emotional uh, intelligence, right? Not just the IQ, the EQ, um, empathy, the ability to learn how to listen. Damn, a lot of people don't know how to do that. And they're like, you know, I've been working 30 years. You know who I am? You still don't listen. That is priceless. And and you want to work on something in the office, work on that alone and your company will go through the roof. You know, it's, it is, you're, Jennifer, you nailed it, but it is, it's getting only more and more challenging and it's not just the tech. It's the people the thing, who always make work difficult. Please, Caitlin. Yeah, the thing that I that I noticed mostly with Gen Z is like, it's not what we can make them do, it's how we can make them feel, how we can remove their fears and, and move them forward in order to kind of, because they're going to figure out the technology regardless. They, they've been using iPads yeah, since exactly. they were babies. So it's not, it's not about how to use it, it's how to make them want to use it. And also how to make them feel like, what they're doing is something positive because on the same side that we celebrate technology, we also uh, make it like uh, the enemy as well. And and so I think a lot of the time we're a feely, feely generation. We want to feel good about what we're doing, but we're all scared about recognition. Oh, people are going to be watching me what I'm doing. No, in fact, recognition can help protect you. People using your face on other accounts, uh, you know, like mm-hmm. understanding how those things can positively benefit us instead of always considering the things that are going to be negative for us. And that's, that's the real battle. I think, I you know, you completely agree. And so you've got to look at it as yes. And <laughs> Thomas, mm-hmm. I, I'm laughing only because I remember my first job, my boss could care less about my feelings. You know, yeah. he basically just yelled at me, says, just do what I told you to do. Right. And a lot of us are brought up with that mentality. And it's very hard to deal with a generation that's going to not stop. That's all that's coming now is I have to worry about your feelings. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you have this thing called AI and humanoid robots are coming after that. And oh, by the way, there's more Gen Z's coming. Right. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the new workspace. Mm -hmm. This must be addressed. This must be a discussion every day especially by top leadership, especially you cannot ignore this. It's easy to talk about tech and not do anything, Mm -hmm. but you cannot ignore your culture Mm -hmm. and you can, it will destroy you quicker than than a a, a financial mistake. Also about purpose too. Like if I can just get a robot to do this, like what's the point of me even doing it? You know, like Mm -hmm. having the understanding that it's, that we're doing something positive in the tech world is really important. Like 
an idea that it came into mind was for the recognition, like human trafficking. Can we use recognition to identify features that are a certain age, you know, that's going to motivate someone to use it. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. What, what I see in a lot of companies that are on that leaning in and getting a real advantage is, is the leadership all the way down to the lowest level recognize no one person has the answer. I mean, unfortunately, you can't just send people off to a training class on mm -hmm. how to use the latest technology because it will have changed by the time they get to the class. But what we do see is the organizations that say, we don't know what the future is going to be, but what we're going to do is we're going to give everybody the wherewithal and the empowerment to explore and have maybe it's weekly, maybe it's every three day check-in, little miniature learning labs yeah. where we each try something different each week. We get together and we share and we see how that works. Where we have an open dialogue and there's trust in sharing, what are you really passionate about? What do you see as your purpose? How does that fit together? So it's a collaborative process and the leaders are vulnerable enough to say, I don't know how to lead people through this kind of change, but let's do it together. And um, Jennifer, you know that, and, and the environment should be one Gen Z with one boomer yep. side by side. So that the Gen Z starts to understand that the boomer is not just an old person who should be ignored, but hey, this person has, has they're quite smart and <laughs> they have a different skill set than me. And the boomer gets to say, hey, the Gen Z is not just annoying. They just see the world completely different. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is, is you're building a bridge of cultures in that in that organization, in that company, in that project, mm -hmm. right? Versus all this conflict and all this stuff, right? Because I make I love joking with Gen Zs because I have three of them in my house, and. I just go to my kids and I just say, hey, listen, I don't get it. And they make fun of me and then they explain it to me. And it's okay. I don't see the world the way you guys do. You don't see the world I do, the way I do it, but together we can figure it out. And like Jennifer said, you can't take a course on this. There is no course. It is what we all have done since the beginning of time. Human beings spend time with human beings. We get to know each other. We learn from each other and we grow together. That's the answer. Mm-hmm. That's it. It's always going to be the answer. That's how you have a great company and a great workplace. You find purpose and all those things. Spend time with people, talking to people. It really doesn't work on Teams. It doesn't work on Zoom. Just being in the same aura as someone, smelling someone's perfume or lack of perfume <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> oh, all these, okay. oh, you know, but it's human dynamics. Mm -hmm. That is what is going to solve this. And as Jennifer was talking before, Leaders who can create that environment in their project or their team. That's the that's that's the amazing person. That's what we should be working on, creating more of those people. Philip, you had a uh, comment, it looked like, and I'm just recognizing that that we're we are three minutes before the hour. Thomas and I will be here for another 30 minutes and want to continue the dialogue. I will bring up, we have a little survey that I'll bring up the QR code and the link. But Philip, did you have a, a point you wanted to share? You looked like you did. This is the link to the survey. Yeah. So we, uh, I didn't notice we were, I was so into talking. So yeah, we're approaching the top of the hour. No one has to stay. It's just uh, quite often people have questions after we're done recording, so we'll yeah, stay here. Other other questions, comments, I'll put the link on the survey here in the chat. Hopefully that came across. Yeah, please fill out the survey. Um, what the survey is about is real simple. Um, we just like to know what did you think and where would you like us to go in the future? That's, um, that's, that's it. Um, we could come up with our own talking points, but the best thing is to talk about what you want to know, talk about. Knut, do you have to go ahead, Knut. Yeah, hi. Uh, a question or, or if you can comment on uh, uh, the security and accountability of uh, companies that use AI tools to, to make their own services. Where do you think we are uh, uh, on the on the 
security laws and regulations around this. Okay, so I could start off by addressing that in two areas. So the EU just approved the world's first governance around AI, and I believe that was two or three weeks ago. And that will begin to be implemented in May, and then we'll see the effects of that probably around Christmas as well. And what that's going to do is going to protect protect us and protect your identity, just sort of like GDPR, right? So, uh, for example, there's a lot of videos being made today with AI. In the EU new EU regulations, it says that if this video was made with AI, you have to state that in the video. Otherwise, because the world of deep fakes is taking off, we don't know what actor has done this or that or that. So that's why the EU. So they're doing, they've placed and in, put into policy regulations to protect people from the power of some parts of AI, not all. That's, that's the political answer to your question. Then in regards to companies and their data, you implement an AI. So both Microsoft and Google as well as Amazon, they allow you to create a, a, a work environment that is encrypted and that is belonging to your own company. So when you take that data and you train it against, let's use Google Gemini, they guarantee that data is staying within your protected encrypted space and is not being used to train the future of Google Gemini. And that's an enterprise agreement that, um, Google came out with Google Gemini two about a month ago that they guarantee if you sign an enterprise agreement, we'll encapsulate it and you're not training Google Gemini. If you use Google Gemini on the internet or chat GPT on the internet and you ask it a question, you are training it for the future. So that's how your companies protect themselves, get an enterprise agreement, and then that data is protected and not shared in the states within the corporation. Did I address your answer in the areas you, the way you want me to? Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and uh, it's a big question or big topic, I, I, I guess. But I also um, thought of the, the who is responsible if your service, uh, you know, creates a, a, a dangerous situation or even kills somebody or who, where where who is responsible and and yeah. and also uh, ref the the software making ai service if uh, if uh, the software has is is uh, erroneous at uh, it's making kind of the the tesla uber self driving car that hit somebody question yeah, yeah. times 5000 uh, uh, i yeah. i smile not out of disrespect knut i smile because oh. that that is an excellent question that is yet to be solved because at what point is the AI responsible then the human responsible? Where is that inflection point in the code? Yeah. <laughs> it's not, and with the computer, with AI writing and rewriting his own source code as you talk, there is right. no point in the code because the code is changing in real time. Excellent question. I smile because you're obviously a very intelligent guy who nailed a question that we lawyers obviously are not technical people and they can't solve it, but they want to put some type of regulation on it. But we, we, the creators of the AI can't even answer the question because they're creating the AI to self create itself. So very complicated question. No answer to that question yet. What, what even in intellectual, go ahead, sorry, Caleb. sorry, Jennifer, I was just speaking about, uh, even in inte intellectual property law, there's, there's some blurry lines and that's not even to do with all of the extensive <laughs> engineering behind robotics. Like if, for instance, uh, intellectual property, uh, laws were only about, um, like previously published works. And now we're seeing that we don't know how to handle it with social media. And so it, even that's been a challenge before, so. Yes, Very, listen, again, to remind everyone, ChatGPT, which was a first gen AI, was born 20 months ago. Yep. Literally came out of the womb 20 months ago. And we got hit with these problems now. It's we're very early in trying to understand all this. And the examples, that I gave and gave him previous things is to show you how fast this is moving. And it's a baby. Um, Caitlin, you have a little one. 
what is a 20 month old baby doing is it what is what is standing up at 20 months right but really? uh, yeah. all yeah they're they're walking they're running they're they're playing <laughs> they're they're trying to climb but still working on that one and they're trying to talk and in the uh, video and we regulate saw... their emotions <laughs> <laughs> well so human beings we will always have a challenge with that one my my point is that we saw a video today of a humanoid robot having a conversation in the kitchen looking around being aware is in a kitchen fed somebody cleaned up the kitchen it's only 20 months old understand so this is accelerating can you, you you that's your question is one of probably a million more questions which is a great question of and, and we'll figure this out as we go, you know. Um, but the point to our thing is I'm impressed that all of you showed up to this session because you're aware of it and you're willing to discuss. And uh, that's the that's what we want to do to yes. make this a discussion point. Jennifer, please. Yeah, ju just to kind of echo on that, because I, I fundamentally believe the thing that we all need to do and what we as leaders need to encourage and train people around us to do is to learn to be discerning. And, and I know not everybody's native English speaking, but to me, discernment means looking carefully at things, really thinking about where did this come from? Mm. Who might have created the tool, the bot, the PowerPoint, the resume? What was their purpose? And let's think about when we look at something, does this make sense? And if there's any question, then go back and question it. It's up to us to take that extra time to think. Hmm. And I, I know, you know one of the comments Thomas made is somebody that used to spend eight hours doing a task, they now do it in 15 minutes. That gives that extra seven and a half hours. Well, those seven and a half hours could be used really taking extra time to think about what did that robot actually create? How did it work? If I took it to a different level, what might happen? Let's look more closely at the social media that we have coming across. Let's really digest in more detail that resume that we got instead of glancing over it and saying, hey, this looks good. Let's move her forward. Let's go deeper. Let's look back at that person's LinkedIn and compare it to the resume and Google the person. Let's take the time to still do what we've always done. And if we use the technology to do the basic task, we have more time to be discerning and think about things. And, and that's, that's kind of my fundamental premise of what we as people can do to learn, grow, and guide the technology, not be overrun by it. Well said. Annalisa, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Yeah, I just thought, though, um, I worked in um, telemarketing companies for uh, many years back. And quite early, we started to talk about RPA. Hmm. And now it's here. So yeah. it always takes some years i know that we had different companies that my uh, sale team should uh, try to book meetings for this rpa rpa and all these managements we um, talked to they said oh no this is nothing for us so that is also something to remember yep. when the technology comes up with new systems it always takes some time before human being already yep yeah mm -hmm. that's that's why i said that um the first robots will be something very simple so that with we we, we all of us need time to get ready mm -hmm. is the technology is always ahead of us mm -hmm. um the first deployments of the first humanoid robots will be in minds in physical environments that human beings don't like working in you ever worked in a mine that's a kilometer underground? Nobody wants to be there. But that robot could work down there. It doesn't sweat. It won't stop. It'll work. It doesn't need light, so I'll save money on electricity. I don't have to worry about oxygen or methane gas poisoning people, right? So those robots will first be deployed there, and that is what they're talking about. It'll be used in factory-type environment and difficult climate environments. And in the meantime, your new 
cool. I was gonna say colleague. I don't know. I don't even. I think we need a new word <laughs> set. But the the thing or person or I don't I don't next to you in the office will be some device, some arm, something, mm -hmm. and we'll get used to it. And over time, and you're 100 percent right, Annalisa. Your new colleague that's gonna be human or robot, three to five years down the road, only because the human beings. Yes. Would, Right. That's the only reason mm -hmm. the tech. But again, I remind everybody, you just saw Chad GPT married to human or robot today. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen by summer? What's going to happen by <laughs> Christmas? But, but, but um, Thomas, do you see any difference between these all the different generations for the human? I mean, we are an elder generation, might be, but you have... As you see, uh, said generation C, gen we had generation Zeta, we had yeah. millenniums, and so on. I think also things go faster with the younger generation. I so technology goes faster with the younger generation. Yeah, the older generation but they accept it. Yeah, uh, but, but easier. Yeah, but the older generation has a life. Of experience and they understand compassion yes. they understand love mm -hmm. they understand empathy they know what wisdom wisdom is based on years of experience you can't you can't exactly. buy wisdom right so the older generation brings all that into the office environment into the culture of the company and then the young people bring all of this in uh, innovation challenging and it's the marriage when you make it that marriage perfect so older generations to feel awkward in the workplace no hang out with the young people, work with them side by side, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a better culture. You have a better work day. Mm -hmm. So never, I don't downplay any, my kids have convinced me, they said that we're all boomers, I, you know, because <laughs> maybe, but they, they did go, Papa, you're such a boomer, right? Whatever. Um, we are extremely valuable, but the, there are some of us who are more valuable because we, we don't mind showing and talking about love in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, that's what human beings need. And so and a leader that can show love without talking about love, who can give love, who could make everybody feel comfortable and accepted. Yeah. That's a fantastic, powerful leader. And that's probably to come more from the boomers than mm -hmm. from the Gen Zs. Mm -hmm. Right. But the Gen Zs are going to remind you about my feelings and that leader is going to go, I respect your feelings. Yes. So it's, we could talk for quite a lot. There's a very big conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I actually have a question. Uh, I just wondered it. what your perspective was in regards to how the willingness to adopt uh, AI is, relates to political views. Does is there a trend? And what do you mean by political views? What do you mean by that? Like, like for instance, someone who's more conservative uh, might be a little bit less willing to adopt something that's going to uh jeopardize their job position you know this is so uh, cool a liberal might might be less willing to adopt uh the ai because they're scared of the danger associated to it so this is a classic example where i had to ask you a question to qualify your question is that that's the generational gap us boomers we don't even think that way. I have to ask you a question to possibly understand where the hell are you coming from? <laughs> because <laughs> now Philip was wondering the same thing, I think. So, <laughs> so maybe he's a Gen no. Zer. No. <laughs> so and and Caitlin, I'm 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 not making fun of you at all. Oh, I'm Gen Z. You guys, girls, doesn't matter. Are wired, and you have all these things there, and they're all important. Us old boomers. Nice. We have other things in our head. And it's an interesting conversation to take those two generational differences and let's talk about it. Because political is very strange in my head to listen to you. I can understand intellectually where you're coming from, but I don't think that way. But I also know that there's a hundred million of you that think that way, and there's gonna be a couple hundred million more coming. So interesting question. When you think about liberty, liberty and, and freedoms, you know, people get very tied in with their feelings about that. And, and that's tied with both politics and AI. Philip, you know? jump in. I, I'd love to hear your, your viewpoint on this. Great conversation. Well, I, I, <laughs> they're a boomer. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll say that we're actually ahead of Gen Z on AI. Mm. Ooh, there we go. Throw down, the, 
right? <laughs> because for the very simple reason that we've got, we haven't got much time left. Oh my God. And we want to make the most of our time. And so I'm actually seeing in a whole lot of areas where the most aggressive people making use of AI are boomers. They're typically people who are independent and um, mm -hmm. used to be operating as consultants, so used to working from home, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we are ahead of the game. Very much, you know, I'm, I'm at the moment, I'm on a pro progress, uh, I'm generating a master's course in six weeks. Oh. Right, using um, technology which has been developed by an Australian company. I mean, it's terrifying. But it's also at the same level incredibly exciting. And I'm looking at young colleagues in the world of um, academia mm -hmm. who are writing policies banning AI in universities. Oh, I kid you not. That is happening for the very simple reason, where do academics make their money? They're making their money by writing articles and they get paid for the copyright. And they see these LLMs destroying that income stream. Now, to be honest, I have no answer for how we overcome the issue of copyright and patents and everything, because what LLM, is, you know, what, what AI is doing is in a way, and I'll, I'll use this term, democratizing knowledge, mm -hmm. universalizing okay. knowledge, mm -hmm. and therefore the authors of knowledge have a real problem of how on earth you're going to get paid for it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same problem you know, in the music industry with streaming and everything else, so that only a very, very few popular artists you know, end up being billionaires, and most artists end up having the most abysmal lives in terms of their financial status and financial abilities and i think that's going to happen to the academic communities and i think that's also going to be happening in a whole load of other areas as well mm -hmm. you know and i and i think the dynamics here there are so many different cross cross currents going on mm -hmm. you know for instance you know one thing which i am seeing uh i'm sorry i'm, I'm hugging this but i'll just I'll close on. right one thing i'm seeing is that um there was a tremendous surge in people working from home and getting work through um, websites which are yeah, like offloading, offloading work, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those people are suffering. Those people are suffering because that work's no longer going to them. It's being done by AI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are the people who already are seeing their work drying up. Mm -hmm. However... The smart ones amongst those people are using AI and are coming back and saying, hey, we know how to do this. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you guys in the corporate world are playing with it and you're no longer giving us this work, but we're actually mastering it. And the people in the, uh, and dare I say, I put, I'm putting up my generation, the people who, who've done that, in the freelancing world are typically the older people who mm -hmm. have the wisdom using Thomas's term to be able to see what's going on out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? They might not be comfortable with it, but they have the wisdom to see that's the way it's going. Mm -hmm. I, I would strongly agree with all of your perspectives, Philip. And I mean, personally, I fundamentally believe that we are in a complete paradigm shift that in another, is it five years, 10 years, 20 years, we as a global society need to rethink completely the concept of the business model. Mm -hmm. the, the issue of the person that says, I used to be paid X number of dollars or kroners or whatever's per hour to write words on a paper. I mean, that that's gone. That's gone. I mean, you don't need to write words on the paper, but think about what value you're bringing. You're bringing creativity. You're bringing different perspectives. It's not about what you create. 
it's what you what you generate the music mm -hmm. industry taylor swift yeah she, she is not selling a song she's selling an experience yes that's what we pay money for so how can we create a better experience for people that's the love, that's the humanity, that's the empathy, that's the think differently, that's the innovation. And that's what I believe the millennials, Gen Zers are looking for that purpose. How can we create a better planet and a different experience and a better way of being? Not how do we make more money per word, per hour, per anything. I mean, that's not what's important in this new paradigm, in my opinion. I could go off on a tangent. Yeah, but, but Jennifer, you're 100% right. And also boomers. Yeah. Boomers would pay, use all their retirement money for a life experience that would blow their socks off. Yep. And the Gen Zs. So that's the one commonality we all have. Yep. Give me a life experience. Give me a greater purpose. We double all down on experience. That. Yeah, double, double down on experience. Yeah. Um, Potter agrees with us. <laughs> <laughs> and... and Throw, to throw a little more tech into that, and, and we could do this on a future to call, and that is where virtual reality comes from, right? Um, where you can put on a headset and be someplace else and experience something else. Mm -hmm. so, but we could do that in another day because we spent another hour just going to that. But that is about experiences. Mm -hmm. And that market is, um, you know, Facebook changed the name to Meta because of the Metaverse, blah, blah, blah. All that's, that's, that's baby stuff. That's not even been, it's been, yeah, I guess it came out the womb. So it's born. But it's taking its time growing up while AI and humanoid robots is exploding on a rocket. Mm -hmm. That metaverse stuff, when it's ready, want to talk about the fulfillment of experiences? Mm -hmm. This is what I see. You can pay somebody from uh, Upwork or something. Say they're in, um, oh, let's pick a country with some one of the world's great wonders. You can pay them because they live nearby. Mm -hmm. I will pay you, let's say, 100 US dollars. Go to the top of that pyramid or whatever. And then you put on your metaverse helmet and you got 360 degree views. You can hear the birds. You can get, uh, what's that called when you're too high and you get uh, nervous and all that. But what's that word called? Um, oh, <laughs> oh, I forget about, I forget about what if it is. Adrenaline. Vertigo, Adrenaline? vertigo, it's vertigo, <laughs> vertigo. That's the word. Thank you, Philip. You'll be able to get vertigo in the privacy of your own living room because you actually just feel and see yourself on the top of that pyramid or that uh, waterfall. That's where we're going as well. And that goes to what you're saying, Jennifer, mm -hmm. experiences. Yeah. We all, regardless of, gen of generations, experience. Mm -hmm. Experience of love, happiness, sadness, mm -hmm. elation. You know, that's life. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Powerful stuff. And that goes across all political, yeah. generational, geographic locations. So, I mean, if there's if there's a takeaway that I have leaving our dialogue in another 10 minutes or so, it's what is the impact I have on people? Mm -hmm. and, and how can we each help those around us, our team members, our colleagues, our friends, our associates, our enemies? How can we help people have a better experience as we do journey through this paradigm shift together. Exactly. Exactly. Well said. Is there anybody, any, anybody have any last reflections? Um, and again, to just, there is a survey uh, in the chat. Please fill out the chat. Knut, you take care of you. Anybody got to go take care of yourselves. All right. Thank you so much for staying See on as long as you did. Back in May, May 7, right? Yeah. yeah. Giannis, thank you for attending as well. I know you got to run as well. So May 7th is our next one. Yeah, let's do a recap. So May 7th, which is a Tuesday. We like to stick to our Tuesday. So May 7th, uh, same time, same Bat Channel. If you grew up watching Batman in the United States, you know that slogan. Um, the May 7th, 4 o'clock Oslo time, we yeah. are having the same session. Uh, we... I think we have, we have we chose a title yet? Um, I believe we have, but it is not top of my mind. Um, but we'll okay. also look at the service. Uh, a topic. I'm sorry? One more time, Amari. Sorry, we haven't chosen a title yet, but we do have our topics in mind. I wanted to interject before, but um, Annalise, it, it, our next one goes very deep into what you
I, I think you got cut off there. It goes deep into. Maybe put it in the chat. She was having some audio issues earlier. So, uh, AI, millennials, and Gen Z. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. No worries. Across the different uh, generations. <laughs> that's perfect. Because we, we see, well, it was funny, when we, before this, we Jennifer and I, we spoke about NMRI. We spoke about what to talk about next. We had a feeling that the whole generational discussion was hot. This, this conversation proved this. Why yeah. not? <laughs> <laughs> so.